1 Peter. This letter is written to Christians living in the northeastern edge of the Roman Empire, likely in the early 60s, before the state-sponsored persecution of Nero. But there's a theme as we go through this letter that there is persecution happening. It's most likely local persecution, just hatred of Christians, um, distrust of Christians, but this hasn't kicked up to the level of state-sponsored persecution yet. And while many of uh, Paul's letters are written to churches in major metropolitan areas, it's been said that 1 Peter is a trip into the backwoods of the empire. A trip into the backwoods. These regions are not the cultural centers of the Roman world. And the churches that Peter is writing to represent a pretty large area, about 750,000 miles. Most of modern-day Turkey is what we're talking about. That's where these cities are. I think of it as the American South plus all of Texas. So Tennessee down to Florida, Carolina, all the way through to El Paso. It's a pretty big, pretty big spot. It's also interesting that uh, Peter is writing to a primarily Greek audience. That is very interesting because if you remember, Peter had a mission to the Jews while Paul had a mission to the Gentiles. Yet we know those were not hard and fast rules, right? Paul even ministered in synagogues. But then there's Peter himself. Peter represented both the best and the worst of the apostles. The best and the worst. He gives us the clearest declaration of who Jesus is when he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. He also rebuked and denied Jesus. He rebuked and denied Jesus. It's been said that knowing Peter's history, his talk of grace and peace is no mere formula. Because he knew the depth of his need, Peter loved Jesus the grace of God. First Peter is also written in beautiful Greek, which could be surprising from a Jewish fisherman. But Peter would have been fluent in Greek because it was the language of trade and commerce, not his primary language, but how he would do business. He had to have known Greek. And isn't it true that formal education is not what produces the most stunning art in our culture or any culture? It's not just formal education that will produce beautiful things. He also could have had a Greek-speaking secretary. It's very common. Most of the New Testament was likely written by someone speaking, dictating. So that could have been the case. But it's a beautiful and it's a lit- original language, but not just in its original language. First Peter is stunning, and the beauty, beauty comes through in English as we read these familiar passages. First Peter is a beautiful treatment on hope, wholeness, and holiness in the Christian life. Hope, wholeness, and holiness in the Christian life. It reminds us over and over again that we belong to God and we belong to one another. We belong to God, we belong to one another. So over the course of the letter, we'll see how this belonging shapes our personal and inward hope and holiness, but that it also shapes our outward, our relational hope and holiness. Hymn writer John Fawcett tells us that this glorious hope revives our courage. It is this glorious hope that we'll consider over and over to bring life and courage where there was once discouragement and spiritual death. So let's pray, and then we'll consider the first two verses of the letter of 1 Peter. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this time in your word. We do pray that you would speak. I pray, Lord, that the words of my mouth and meditations of my heart would be pleasing in your sight and yours alone, my rock and my redeemer. Write these things on our hearts. Transform us by your spirit. Illuminate your word. It's in your precious name I pray. Amen. 1 Peter 1.1 Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and for sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Amen. This is God's word. The other day, my sixth grader called me into her room to help with some math homework. And I knew I was not the best suited parent for this task, but I walked in, and as she showed me a division problem, I had a bit of an out-of-body experience. 
I, uh, my mind was blank. I was on top of the mountain, and I discovered that I knew nothing. I could not help. I did not know. That part of my brain that held arithmetic had long since atrophied. But I had a bit of a flashback to the early days of Redeemer. I was a young college student with a head full of hair, and we had a tutoring ministry, but I was busy during the tutoring time, so I went down to what is now torn down, the Tisdale Library right here by Chastain Middle School. And tutors would go there, and they had a basement. It was filled with water, which is why they tore it down. But before that, it was filled with Chastain Middle School students, and I was the one tutor. And I walk in, and I was golden when it came to science and history and that type of thing, English. But then one student walks up with long division, and the same thing happens. I just have no idea what's going on, and I can't help them at all. But Bible math is something different. Bible math, I understand. There's something about when God tells us about the 144,000 in Revelation, or the seven, that those numbers represent completion and fullness. There's something about that, to me, that makes sense. Or that one plus one equals one, when we're talking about Jew and Gentile being made a new man in Christ. That math makes sense to me. So, I'm asking you to join me. We're going to do some Bible math today. Are you ready for the challenge? Hopefully you don't blank out the way that I do whenever I come across math problems. This morning we see grace and peace multiplied. That's Peter's prayer for these churches and my prayer for you. That grace, would, grace and peace would be multiplied in your heart. In this greeting, grace and peace are the answer And thankfully, Peter shows his work and quickly and clearly outlines for us the problems, but most importantly, the solution. So today, I hope you walk away knowing that the grace and peace of God is multiplied in us as a people by God's purpose and that this shapes our prayers. I want you to walk away from here today knowing that the grace of God is multiplied in us as a people by God's purpose, and that this shapes our prayers. Let's consider these as Peter addresses them in turn. A people, a purpose, a prayer. First, a people. Look with me again at verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Peter begins by establishing who he is and who they are. He's an apostle. He's been with Jesus. Like we said, he rebuked Jesus and he's been rebuked by Jesus. When the rooster crowed, Jesus looked straight at him and straight through him. Protestant churches in Europe would often put a rooster on their churches, a symbol of the weakness of man and yet the power of God. It's not about Peter. But God did choose the foolish things of this world. It's been said that this letter is to be seen not as the pious opinion of a well-wishing friend, but as the authoritative word of one who speaks for the Lord of the church himself. Peter is an apostle. An apostle. Next, he calls these believers the elect exiles of the dispersion. It's a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? What this means is that they are chosen. They are scattered pilgrims, sojourners. There's so much meaning packed into these little descriptors. But let's unpack it a little bit. All these terms were used to describe Israel in the Old Testament. Israel in the Old Testament. The little family of Abraham chosen from amongst all the mighty, more impressive nations to belong to God, elected, handpicked by God's gracious initiative. There was nothing in Israel that made them worthy of that honor, and yet it was theirs. They belonged to God. Little Israel. Now, what about this word exiles, which could be translated as pilgrims or sojourners? Israel, despite the honor showered on them by God, rejected him to be like the cultures around them. They were wanderers at the beginning as they came out of Egypt, as they were set free from slavery into the wilderness. They wandered, and they were wanderers without a home again when they were carried away by Babylon. He says they're of the dispersion, the diaspora. 
This referred to the scattered Jewish people living around the world after exile. And yet, remember, this is a primarily Gentile church. Do you see what's happening? There may have been some ethnically Jewish believers in this church, but not many. By calling them these names, Peter is including them. By calling them these names, Peter is very intentionally including them where they had been excluded. He's associating with them as a Jew himself. He's showing these people that they belong to God. As God's people, they too live in the tension of being beloved and chosen on the one hand, yet without a true home in this world on the other, as scattered exiles. These Christians represented many ethnicities and languages, yet Peter focuses on their status before God. He could have spoken to so many different things about them, but he hones in on their status before God. Why? Lord willing, if you're in this church for long enough, you will think to yourself, I have nothing else in common with that person besides Jesus. And I think that's a good thing. I have nothing else in common with that person besides Jesus. Our common interests, our convictions, our opinions, and even our common culture only hold up for so long. They only hold up for so long. It is when your unity has been shaken by disagreement that you must remember who you really are in Christ if you are to keep a community together. So let's turn and consider this people another way. They've converted to Christianity from pagan religions. Imagine the life and culture whiplash that they are experiencing. The beliefs and practices they once walked in are now radically at odds with their new way of life. And yet, they still live in relationship with friends, neighbors, employers, and even spouses who are walking in darkness. How lonely and disorienting it could have been for them. How lonely it could have been. Yet Peter reminds them, don't be surprised. This is what it means to be God's people. We've always been without a home. But we serve a God who would live in a tent while we wandered. We've been through exile. We've suffered. Sojourners and strangers are inherently vulnerable. We read that in Leviticus 19. And Israel must remember that this is who they were and who they still are. This is what it means to be a child of God. We may not fit. We do not fit, whether we see it or not. What Peter offers these believers is belonging, reassurance rooted in the reality that they were strong enough to withstand the disdain, the suspicion, even the mistreatment. We have a God who makes us strong in and through it. We can sustain because we're being sustained. We are strong because the Lord is our strength. These are the people of grace and peace. These are the people of grace and peace. This is the church. They are not a replacement of ancient Israel, nor the beginning of two separate groups. This is the grafting in of tribes, tongues, and nations into the historic people of God. And as we'll see, this is God's purpose from the very beginning. So next, let's consider the grace and peace of God is multiplied to us by his purpose. Look with me at verse 2. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and for sprinkling with his blood. The purpose of God here, his plan, his power for his people is communicated in these itty-bitty prepositions. Okay, so if you're an underliner, you can. It's okay. You can underline these little words. Consider according to, in, and for. According to, in, and for. Each one of these words refer back to the status, the identity of these believers as elect exiles. Verse 2 explains the basis of and implications of God's choice in verse 1. Do you see that? They're elect exiles. How and why is fleshed out in verse 2. 
So first, they are people according to or in conformity with the foreknowledge of God. What does that mean? The word that Peter uses here does not refer to just foresight. Do you see the difference between foreknowledge and foresight? This is electing knowledge, a choice, an initiative of God. This is more aligned with the love of an adoptive parent than that of looking into a crystal ball to see the future. What do I mean? The love of the relationship, the basis and the security of the relationship is established well before the child is born, at the moment when the parents set their heart on them in love. Saying that our identity is according to the foreknowledge of God speaks to God the Father's call on the believer's life. The psalmist puts it beautifully in Psalm 71, For you, O Lord, are my hope, my trust, O Lord, from my youth. Upon you I have leaned from before my birth. You are he who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually of you. That's the kind of love and knowledge. He's pre-loved them. He's foreknown them. One commentator puts it this way. Christians are the elect of God and thus only temporarily resident in the present world. This makes clear their status as resident aliens so long as they remain in the world. Their existence receives its definition and direction from the future and not from the present, from God and not from the world. They are the foreknown, the beloved of God. So next, this is all happening in or by means of the sanctification of the Spirit. If God the Father initiates by calling, salvation itself is worked out by the sanctification of the Spirit. The phrase Peter uses here for in sanctification could easily be rendered as to or towards holiness. Now, this could refer to kind of the inward making holy, becoming more like Christ, but there's also this instance, something that was set apart to be holy, something was set apart as sacred. I think both of those realities can be happening, that personal holiness, but then also that setting apart. The progressive growth of holiness and wholeness in the life of the Christian. The Shorter Catechism defines sanctification as the work of God's free grace whereby we are renewed in the whole man after the image of God and enabled more and more to die unto sin and to live unto righteousness. The Father calls, God the Holy Spirit transforms. He makes us new. Next, we see four, this is all four obedience to Jesus Christ and four sprinkling by his blood. The purpose of our calling, the purpose of our status as elect exiles is to obey Jesus, walking with God, God's way. Think about how God called them out of Egypt and brought them to himself at Sinai to give them his word, his law. You were saved to be set apart. You were saved to be sacred. You were saved to be holy. You were saved to belong to God. We see that we're called and transformed for an active obedience, right? But there's also a passive part of this. There's a reception. Peter says that we are set apart as a people for sprinkling with his blood. Set, a, set apart for sprinkling? That might sound strange to our 21st century ears. What is he talking about? That we're set apart for sprinkling. But Sprinkling cleansed lepers in Leviticus 14, and it ordained priests in Exodus 29. Let me say that again. Sprinkling cleansed lepers in Leviticus 14, and it ordained priests in Exodus 29. Sprinkling inaugurated the covenant with Moses in Exodus 24. Listen to what it says. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And we will be obedient. Little did they know. Narrator, they did not. And Moses took the blood and threw it on the people. And said, behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Do you hear the parallels here? Can you imagine coming here and just being splattered? That's what happened. It's a gory mess. 
but it's a picture of what, we, what must happen. Our sin must be covered by the blood of the innocent lamb. The act of sprinkling is a picture of God's generosity of grace in both covering and washing sinners. It covers and washes us. And in establishing and consecrating someone to a new role, this sprinkling language is the language of justification. The act of God to cover our sin, to pardon us, and to welcome us into a new family. Hebrews 10, verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. That's more beautiful than the first, isn't it? It's more beautiful than being splattered with blood. Sprinkling for cleansing. This image of sprinkling is why I cherish the memories of clean, warm water, creating little streaks of baby hair on the heads of my children. I remember it. I remember them crying because they didn't like it. They didn't know what was happening at the time, but they can look back on it and remember it. Gone is all the blood. That blood was given with finality and perfectly by Jesus on the cross. We belong to the covenant community by water and by the word now. And though my children must place their trust in Christ and walk with him in the free grace of of obedience, I know that if they belong to him, there isn't a single thing that my sin or their sin can do to separate them from the love of Jesus. Do you know that? They must come to faith, but there is not a single thing that will come between them and the love of God. That's sprinkling. By water, by the word, by the blood of Jesus. Justification was accomplished at the cross for them. The Father calls, the Spirit transforms, and the Son, He justifies. The Son justifies We are who we are as a people according to the call of the Father by the transformation of the Spirit for obedience and cleansing by the blood of Christ. This is who we are and how we came to be. It's why we're even here. This is why we can have grace and peace. Now, for the people of God, grace and peace are accruing with compound interest. Grace and peace are accruing with compound interest. This brings us to the next part of the passage. Grace and peace is multiplied in us, and that shapes our prayers. He simply says, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. It's not just a nice thing to say at the beginning of a letter. It is part of a formal greeting, but there's so much here. Everything he affirms about the people who are receiving this letter, this is the point. He prays that they would enjoy grace and peace. Not only that, but that it would multiply in them. Multiply. The word for greetings in Greek shares a root with the word for grace in Greek. And shalom, a Hebrew greeting, was a wish for peace. Grace and peace. Greetings and shalom. Shalom being that wish for harmony, for goodness, for blessing. Do you see it? He greets this church, which is a blending of Jew and Gentile together, with a blend of their two forms of greetings. How cool is that? Grace and peace shape even our hellos and our goodbyes. Grace and peace. I was about eight or nine years old when we joined a new church in my hometown. The church was founded in like 1842, and it was still filled with many families that had been there from the very beginning. I often felt like one of the few kids who was not a cousin with someone else in the class. But I distinctly remember meeting one of the elders, and a few things stood out to me about him as a child. First, he talked to me and not just to my parents. And that matters a lot, church that you see the youngest and the littlest among us. But then also it was his greeting, okay? He always said grace and peace. Not, hey, how are you? Not, how's it going? Grace and peace. 
At the time, it seemed a little formal, but little did I know how much it was a prayer and a blessing over my life. I started hearing that regularly when I was eight, nine years old. Grace and peace. His greeting has stayed the same as I've grown. His spiritual care for me continues. In phone calls, grace and peace. In text messages and emails, the signature is grace and peace. His grace and his peace was and is a mark of belonging with a brother in Christ. I hope that I would know and enjoy. It was a hope for me that I would know and enjoy what was already mine in Jesus. He was reminding me of what was already mine because of everything we just said. Because of the Father, because of the Son, because of the Spirit, we can enjoy grace and peace. Y'all, tell that to each other. Pray that for one another. Impart grace and peace to one another in the way that you speak to each other, in the way you love one another, in your prayers for one another. Seek to bring grace and peace in the body of Christ here at Redeemer. Notice that Peter doesn't just pray for grace and peace, but that it would be multiplied. Multiplied. This is why I say that the power of the gospel causes grace and peace to accrue with compound interest. Grace and peace beget more grace and peace. What is possible here is an abundant grace, an abundance of peace. What we're talking about here is exponential growth. Exponential growth. If you're as bad at math as I am, you'll want to know that that refers to multiplication that grows faster and greater with each passing moment. Think about it this way. Starting in 1930, it took 120 years to add 1 billion humans to our earth. 120 years. But starting in 1975, it only took 24 years to add 2 billion people. So if you're imagining a line, it got greater and greater and greater very steeply. That's what it means for something to grow exponentially. That's multiplication taking its effect. That's exponential growth. Remember the context of these Christians in Asia Minor. They were despised on account of their new life in Christ. They were experiencing persecution and suffering. This greeting by Peter must have been extremely comforting in that although they were rejected where they were living, they did belong somewhere. Their hope was to travel in that direction. Their hope was to travel in that direction. That direction, to return for a moment to the math of the Bible, is the Y and X axis of grace and peace, growing exponentially as our hearts and lives are more and more marked by God's gracious choice and transforming power, arriving one day to an entirely different plane of graphing paper entirely. It's just going to bust through that graph paper and reach something that's more 3D, maybe even four-dimensional like C.S. Lewis talks about, a place that's so real that when you walk, it, the grass actually hurts your feet. That's what we're talking about when we talk about hope. The end of grace and peace is hope. And it's being multiplied in each of you. And then in each of you together, it's adding and multiplying on top of each other. This new place is called hope. And that's what Peter's going to talk about over the course of this whole letter. So hope revives us. This glorious hope revives us. And so may grace and peace be multiplied to you, in you, and through you. Now, you may be and perhaps should be protesting a little bit right now. Because I'm describing this very positive X and Y axis, multiplication, grace and peace, getting greater and greater and greater. But you see there's another line. And it feels like it's going like this. I want to encourage you that both can be true at the same time. We're going to talk about that in the next passage. That things fall apart. That this world is groaning. That though the outer man is wasting away, the inner man is being renewed day by day. Do you see that that's kind of where we are? That's our point between those two lines. Things are getting worse in our bodies, but grace and peace can and must be accruing and growing exponentially. Next time I'm with you, we're going to talk about how those two things can coexist.
But for right now, I want to pray for grace and peace. And I want you to pray for one another for grace and peace. The call of the Father, the justification of the Son, the sanctification of the Spirit leads to multiplication. Let's pray that for one another right now. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for your good news. We're thankful for this grace and peace. Your unmerited love for us, Lord, and harmony in our relationships and our world. We lament our broken bodies. We lament our broken souls. We lament our broken world. But Lord, I pray that you would multiply. I pray, Lord, that you would root us in who we are as elect exiles. May we never forget that. Shape us. Lead us. Thank you for these people. Thank you for their grace and peace. And thank you for giving us one another. Be glorified now in our songs. Be glorified in our prayers. We love you. And it's in in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen.